young and emerging artists, up next on Carpe Diem. The program you're about to watch is part of a special series of Carpe Diem episodes. They're produced by students of the Television Digital Media major at Montclair State University. Now, here's your host, Jack Smith IV. Thank you for joining us on this special edition of Carpe Diem. I'm Jack Smith IV, and today we're focusing on young artists in New Jersey. Whether it's sound, performing, or visual arts, each person we'll see today is maturing into the new world that they'll help create. Usually when we think of high school, we remember math exams, science experiments gone wrong, and tedious English papers. And yes, while all of this is definitely vital, they often lack the most important lessons that only the arts can provide. Kelly Klein met with South Plainfield High School Drama Club to find out just how the performing arts are bettering the lives of young adults. <laughs> I think the arts are so important. It, it, teaches, it teaches teamwork and respect and communication and expression and um, a sense of community. You know, one of the things that we've tried to build here more than anything is a sense of kind of a drama community that w you can always come back. Um, and, and I think it teaches, it teaches trust and um, so many things that you need as you go forward in your adult life. Being a part of the arts in any um, aspect, like musically, dramatically, in theater, um, and artistically with anything else, it has shown me that um, there's always room to keep learning and to keep growing. Slow down. If it sounds ridiculous, yeah. it sounds great out there. Okay. okay? You're just learning to be part of something. And I think as people, we have a natural tendency to want to feel a part of something. And when we're given, when we're blessed with a talent that it gives us the opportunity to be a part of something. It strikes the question, how could you not? I've learned a lot about self-confidence and kind of accepting what you have. Like you're not always gonna get the role you want and it doesn't mean that you're not good. It means that it's just, it's not your time and it's not, it's not for you. There's something better for you that'll fit you and that'll show off what you can do. The role I was playing, which is Chiffon, one of the doo-wop girls, it, it was definitely a very, very sassy role. I'm, I'm definitely just, I'd keep to myself and I try not to look for conflict. But um, I think it would definitely teach me to stand up for myself. It gives me like uh, this state of grace where I feel like I can do anything and I can be anything and I could express how I'm feeling through another person or through my music and it just creates this, this sense of home away from home. Even though we talk about people being so dramatic, really in the theater you have to be so rational and think so clearly about certain commitments to your, to your character, to your show, to your everything. One of my favorite things is just the people that you meet because you meet a whole array of personalities and each one impacts how you perform and how you grow as like an individual and as an actor. It gives us a chance to bond. Like I don't share like this bond with like anybody. They're not friends, they're kind of family. So I always treat them uh, like family. I see them at school, I always say, hey, what's up? I think with drama, because the number is so much smaller, I think the ability to build those relationships and to have them last is really important. Most kids, if they didn't already have too many friends, 
like drama would definitely accept them and make them feel like a part of the family and that's what they did with me. I think uh, the family grows every single year and I, and I enjoy that. You know, Jamie was my assistant director for two years and oh my gosh, I'm just gonna, you know, that's, she's like my, fr you know, and I hate to say it like she's my friend because we're obviously on different levels, but she, she, you know, we spend so much time with these people and you get to know them and, and so I think the relationships that I've built are really, for me, have been the foundation of what I do, what, the foundation of what I do, they've been the, what drives me and what keeps me coming back. Miss Briskin offers a lot of opportunity to grow and expand, like she has given me my artistic freedom to a certain extent. Um, with helping choreograph, helping with certain character developments. And then on the more personal level with her, it has developed into a more close-hearted and like family like kind of relationship. I've gained a friend through the experience. Oh, I loved Miss Briskin. She was the most real teacher I've ever had. I want to see you on an Oscar stage someday. That's all. Oh, she's just 100% herself and she's really cool and she's really funny. And I've never had a teacher like her before. She's really, um, she's her own person. I see her as a director and as a really good friend who wants nothing but the best, whether it be for me personally or for the show or for like the, the program as a whole. Henry, last week when you're the bum behind the window, you coughed and it was great. Last week you were like doing this thing and it was so gross and you didn't do it today and I was so disappointed. So commit, that's your, that you've been doing it and that's your move. Like when you realized that the window was too high for you to pick your butt, that became your move and it was such a great choice and I loved it so much. Don't lose it. It's fabulous. My favorite part about being on stage is just like enjoying the moment because you can't you can't think ahead but you can't like you can't think what's behind you you have to live in that moment as somebody else just completely lost in the lights and the pit and the music and everything around you honestly i've always like kind of like thought of it very like magical because it's just you're engulfed somewhere else i think the friday show of little shop of horrors like uh, i made a mistake like i accidentally um had a the um the body parts in a bucket and I went to go take out a body part and all the body parts just spilled everywhere and had to go along with it. And I really just like going along with stuff. It's a talent that I have that I can use to influence, whether it be someone, a group of people, a crowd, an audience. I have that power to influence just as much as any other athlete has to raise a crowd's spirits. My favorite moment, especially every night, uh, was saying my first line. Look, just give me a few more days to heal, okay? Then we'll start again on the left hand and... Feed me! I beg your pardon? Feed me! And even though I'm behind a curtain and behind the sets, hearing the murmurs in the audience, hearing them react, was one of the coolest things ever. It's definitely like made my first year of high school really wonderful. It did teach me a lot about self-confidence and that you need to you need to accept yourself before you can accept a role. So I think I think that really drama club the arts it teaches so much. So much more than it's it's so much more than just putting on a show. There's so much more to it than that. And you know, people don't see that, but it's there. It's it's all it's like a production, right? It's all in the magic behind. Compassion, teamwork, and self-confidence. The students will remember these lessons forever, all thanks to the performing arts. Many young musicians aspire to become breakout stars, but Rachel Miller is already living that dream at age 18. She's proven that she can work hard and dedication can lead to success, no matter how young you are. Mike Bufus brings us a look into Rachel's everyday life as she juggles the burdens of the competitive music industry and all the responsibilities of a high school teen. Hi, my name is Rachel Miller. I am a singer, songwriter, and musician from Bergen County, New Jersey, and I'm an 18-year-old high school senior. Music has always been a huge part of my life. I grew up around it. My mom is a huge fan of the Beatles, and it was always playing in my house, and my dad was really involved in the music industry around the time that I was born. 
So he started teaching me how to play instruments when I was like two-ish, and from then it just developed. Uh, I don't think there was a particular point where she started to get serious. She was always serious. She was always uh, um, deeply involved with any music that she was doing. So there was just a, a series of logical progressions rather than one day her deciding, I'm going to take it seriously now. Um, it's always been a passion, an important passion of hers, and uh, she's just continuing to, uh, to follow it. I first noticed when she was three years old, uh, we were in the pediatrician's office, she had a fever, and she was laying on my lap and she started to play with one of those things that you hit the stick, the xylophone. And she was ding, 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 and she looked up, she says, Mommy, I think I found Happy Birthday. And that's when I knew that she was a true musician. I wrote my first song when I was seven years old, and it was really crappy, but I've been in love with it ever since. Actually, I started listening to Green Day around then, and it had the same chord progression as Boulevard of Broken Dreams, and I thought that Green Day copied me, and I was so upset. And then I realized that that was really stupid. I've been in the music industry since the 80s, so there's always been music around the house, not just music that's been played, like you know, putting on a record or, or playing the radio or something, but music production has always been going on in the house. So um, she, uh, as she has been um, uh, making progress and improving with her own musical journey, so to speak, uh, I, I would try to drop a little seed here and there for her to find rather than trying to tell her to, to pursue a certain direction. So this way, everything that she did was really herself, you know, her own development, her own uh, building up uh, on whatever she was doing before, whatever she heard around the house, and whatever, you know, tiny little seed I might leave around for her. I started performing as a solo artist when I was 16. Being a 16-year-old solo act in a community full of rock bands and hip-hop artists was really intimidating and nerve-wracking, but it was fun all the same. I said no for the longest, longest, longest time. Um, I know what the industry's like. I know how much uh, the adorable child who can sing pretty well will end up getting picked up and then quickly dropped just because uh, they've moved on to the next flavor of the month. Uh, when it hit a point where, you know, we, we started to feel that she really had something that would allow her to develop this into some kind of a real career, that's when we started really giving the green light. But prior to that, you know, we even held with back all the encouragement, there was still the idea of like, you know, let's hold off for a second and not throw you into the lion's den, so to speak. You are I never thought that waiting was an option. I always felt that it was very urgent that I followed this passion and did whatever I could do to make things happen for myself. But there were times when balancing everything was really hard and I wanted to put it off a little bit. One of her first shows, she was so nervous, getting ready, going, we got there. She got up on stage and just whispered down to me, this is home. And that's, I knew that she had it at that point, even with all the nerves and the pre-jitters and stuff like that. Well, I started solo when I was 16, like I said, and I met this girl in my geometry class and she was a drummer and she was a freshman. I didn't really know what to expect from her. And as we got to know each other more, we realized how much we had in common. And now we've been working together for about two years and her name is Sophia. I started playing music with Rachel because she had messaged me about performing together at a, a local show. And so I was really excited to start playing with someone at my new school. And then as things progressed more and more, we realized that we were missing something in our dynamic, so we started looking for a guitarist or bassist, and Michelle came in and auditioned, and it was amazing, and it clicked, and she's just, she's so fun to be around. Um, one of my friends had told me that there was a local musician. She was like, oh, I think you should talk to her. She's into the same things that you are, so I was like, all right, well, I'll just message Rachel. So I messaged her, and I was like, I like your stuff, I checked it out, and I think we should jam sometime. And of course, it was just like any other musician, you know, I didn't think she would think too much of it. Um, and she didn't really. <laughs> so we just talked that one time. Um, and then a couple months later went by, we still haven't talked. And then finally I saw a post and it said that she was looking for musicians to back her in her live band. So I said I was interested in auditioning and now here I am.
A typical band practice is usually on a Sunday. So Michelle's normally early. Rachel's a little bit late. And um, we just run through songs and make sure that we nail everything. And there's always a good vibe. And it's always really fun. A typical jam session with me and Rachel always ends up with us laughing or making stupid faces at each other and just having a good time. Just Rachel is a lot of fun because she really wants to make sure that I'm comfortable um, and like I said before we're mainly just really good friends so playing with her is just really chill um, we throw new ideas out see what works see what doesn't work yeah, I mean, and we're just focused on having a good time I'll let you know when I do but I can always plan okay. that around whatever you want to do with the verse well yeah we can always meet with Sophia uh, and see what she thinks too yeah uh, Rachel's love for music definitely drives her. You can tell from when she performs, the way she plays, the way she handles herself, the way she talks about her songs, her music, her passion. That's definitely what drives her. She makes me love what I do. I have to say I'm proud of her just about every day. And you know, you go through that thing where you feel like your heart's gonna burst because it's such a beautiful thing. Without the support that I've received throughout the whole process, I would be nowhere. Um, if it wasn't for the people who believed in me when I didn't believe in myself or the people who came out to shows when it was crappy out and an hour away and a pain in the ass or the people who checked out my music and told their friends and gave me a chance my friends and my family and my bandmates I literally I don't think I would even have the motivation to keep going with it. You can find Rachel's music at rachelmillermusic.com or her latest single, Failure, on iTunes. We're going to take a quick break. Stay tuned for an inside look at an upcoming web series being filmed on campus. Welcome back to Carpe Diem, where we're taking a look at young and talented artists. Film is changing from how it's produced to how, when, and where everyone's viewing it. Two Montclair TV majors, Victoria Nelly and Joe Lees, took on the challenge of producing their very own web series that they could call their own. Jason Burns went behind the scenes of this production to learn how Montclair's very first web series came to be. Action! We're the ones who knock. So RAs is kind of like a play on cops and the office. Um, it's about two RAs, Shannon and RJ. And Shannon's the older, more advanced, and more well-seasoned in the RAs kind of business. If you're going to be dumb, be smart about it. Now get out your IDs and start lining up. And RJ's the rookie. He's really new to it. We hear you got an in with the juice. RJ, you can't just start like that. You have to ease into an interrogation. I play RJ on the uh, web series, and RJ is a little close to home. He's a big goofball, and he's kind of like in his own, um, I want to say in his own world, because he, he walks to the speed of his own music. You know, he's got his own soundtrack to life, and he's just, in this show, he's just looking for an opportunity to get free housing and just enjoy the college life as much as possible. They go around and they try to, you know, bust parties, and they do everything the RAs do. 
their student workers who live inside you know the residence buildings and they enforce the uh, the policies that go on and ensure that nothing is going array so the synopsis of our show is it's still the RA's job but it's taken from a more comedic standpoint and putting these RAs in more <laughs> more fantastical and clearly strung out situations. Wow there are a few of you guys. Hey hey what do you think you're doing? Go back to your room and put some pants on. No yeah we're inspired a lot by The Office and cops. I love The Office with their quick camera movements and you know their zoom ins and their talking head scenes, um, a lot like Parks and Rec and you know all those kind of NBC shows. So we definitely wanted it have that sort of influence. We definitely love the talking head aspect to it and you know the aspect that you know there it is shot like a documentary style. I love cops and The Office and how the format of that show is, and I just wanted to combine those two to create something that's relevant for college students, which is mainly our audience and who we're producing the web series for. Well, you know, I definitely want to work in episodic series television. Um, that's definitely the one form of TV that I'm most interested in and hope to work in. So, you know, I realized we had nothing like that on campus. You know, we have a lot of live-based kind of, we have a newscast, we have, you know, a lot of news packages and just kind of that stuff on campus. So I figured, you know, if we could get this started, I mean, we have so many students that are, want to get involved in things like this. We have a lot of professors that are willing to help and a lot of equipment. So I just kind of went around to most of my, you know, classes related to my major and asked who would be interested in getting started in something like this. And uh, Joe Lees, you know, the co-creator, he definitely showed a huge interest in it. And um, I think that night he sent me over a treatment he had. What motivated me to do it was I didn't know there was anything like this on campus where students can come together no matter what major they are, no matter what year, and just work on a production together. And it was nice to have the film students come in and really you know, help teach the television students you know, how to create a well-formulated narrative. And I just wanted people, like I, I didn't care if the episode was good or bad, I wanted people to be able to have fun on set because that's what it's all about. Like you're not being graded on this. So we mainly just wanted everyone to have a good time on set. Seeing all those people the first day I was on set was actually very, very inspiring. I actually, it, in a little way distracting because I would like try to go over lines or practice with my co-star and I would get distracted. I'm like, wow, that's so cool. I'm like, look what they're doing there. And I would ask questions and I'd be like, that's, that's really, really cool. Some of the challenging scenes for episode one were definitely in my room, uh, the dorm scenes. It was really a tight space and there was about 20 people in my room. And we had the lights going, we had camera, and it was just a really just jumbled up clutter of people. All right, slate. Scene six, C, take two. Everybody settle, get into that party thing. Action. Oh, but I think this first scene we're going to do is uh, scene eight, which is um, the conga line, just because we have a lot of people, and I want to do that earlier so we don't bother people when they're trying to sleep. The first scene we shot was the conga line. They looked like they were having fun. They had to look like they were having fun. We literally just asked all our PAs and all our extras and anybody who wasn't already in the scene or was a necessary crew member to just get on the conga line and just do ridiculous things. Uh, we had them start off in the middle of a hallway and just kind of burst through the door and just scream. I think the biggest accomplishment that me and Victoria had on set for the first episode is that we did it. We got the first episode and thank God that we made the mistakes that we did because we were able to come back with an even better second episode. Episode one was shot on EX1 and then we switched over to a DSLR, you know, 5D for the second episode. I love DSLRs. I think 5D is great. Um, 
we struggled a lot with the EX1 for that, for the pilot. It was just bigger, and bulkier, and just, it had a lot more to it. And it just kind of took up some more time getting that set up. And just, we thought it'd be a, an easier switch. And even if so, we just thought we'd try it out. Um, and I think it was a great idea to do that. And I, I liked it a lot, a lot better. The plot of episode two was just so cool. And also with Joe. Joe was my favorite part of that whole episode when he had to put on the bald cap. What business could you The cook at the end of the episode, that was a you know, clear parody of the Walter White character. That's why he like coughs a lot and he talks with a gravelly voice and like he was wacky. He was wacky fun to play. We're shutting this operation down. What operation? <laughs> You have to put stuff out there and hope that it gets seen and make it get seen. If you have an idea for a story, write it, put it online. You can't just keep it on your computer. Nobody's gonna see it that way. If you have an idea for a show, make it. Even if it's crap, make it. You have to work hard and just believe in what you're doing. My idea for the future of RAs is, is to create more episodes. That's what I'd love to do until I graduate. But when I do graduate, it's my dream to hopefully have somebody that can take over my job and create more episodes after I graduate. You know, just to find the, or that group of students that can really produce well and who are passionate about doing it. And if they want it, it's theirs. And if RAs can live, you know, for a few more years like that, that'd be incredible. If these artists have taught us anything, it's that creativity has no barriers, especially when it comes to your age and how you can have a positive impact on those around you. For more information about this edition or any other edition of Carpe Diem, you can contact us at 973-655-5158 or email us at the address on your screen. I'm Jack Smith IV. Thanks for watching.